Hello, I'm Hazm Seeker. This is Counting the Cost on Al Jazeera, your weekly look at the world of business and economics. How the year-long blockade on Qatar is impacting Gulf economies. Turkey's high-stakes battle to tame its currency, cool its economy and soothe investor nerves. Plus, pressing reset on oil. Find out why the world's largest producers of crude could be rethinking their strategy. A year ago, the four Arab states, Saudi Arabia, the United Arab Emirates, Bahrain and Egypt, imposed a full land, sea and air blockade on Qatar. The richest country in the world per person was forced to tap into its sovereign wealth fund and do everything it could to shore up its economy, banking system and currency. And those efforts have been paying off. Earlier this year, it raised $12 billion in a bond issue. It showed that despite the rift with its Gulf neighbors, international investors still feel confident betting on its future growth. Qatar is reshaping supply lines and developing domestic goods. It's pushing ahead with its $200 billion infrastructure plan, and the world's largest exporter of liquefied natural gas is also busy forging new long-term supply deals. Now, the IMF projects that Qatar's growth will come in at 2.6% in 2018. It says the Saudi economy will expand by 1.7%. The UAE will have 2% growth. Bahrain's outlook is for 3% growth. And the international lender predicts Egypt's economic growth will hit 5.2% this year. Well, joining us now from London is Ahem Kemal, head of Middle East and North Africa at the global risk consultancy Eurasia Group. Thanks very much for being with us. So what's your assessment of how Qatar has weathered uh, this blockade 12 months on? Well, I think Qatar is in a much better position right now. It seems that the economic cost of the blockade or the uh, crisis has been limited. Uh, the government has managed to intervene in certain sectors. It has managed to provide some guarantees. And the central bank has provided much needed liquidity. So it, it is contained. It's far from ideal, obviously, because of uh, the position of Qatar, its geography, its trade links. So this is far, far from a preference. But I think one year after the beginning of the Qatar crisis with the other GCC members, uh, the economy is not crashing. And Qatar seems to have adjusted to what is a very challenging situation. Talk a little bit more then about the ways that Qatar has adjusted uh, to this? Because they, they obviously had a, a, a lot of money um, in, in terms of foreign currency reserves. Uh, they had a lot of kind of ammunition, so to speak, with, with which to, to weather this at the beginning, didn't they? Absolutely. I, I think that the sovereign wealth fund reserves were absolutely important in providing not only stability, but a measure of uh, uh, credibility to the financial sector that Qatar has uh, significant reserves to intervene in the market and help the government manage the crisis. Uh, obviously, the Qatar uh, gas exports uh, did help the country manage its relationships with a lot of countries and make sure that the trade links and those exports are maintained, LNG exports. But I, I think most importantly, on the diplomatic front, we've seen an effort to engage with alternative powers, not only the U.S., but broadly to establish new trade links, try to cement those. So you have uh, Qatar not really in an isolated position internationally. And that's a function of both the importance of the gas reserves and gas exports, but also the financial cushion that Qatar has through its uh, sovereign wealth fund, the Qatar uh, Investment Authority. A much better situation today, I would say. So what's been the regional impact, the broader regional impact of this uh, blockade? So I think that perhaps the impact on the Saudi economy is quite limited, uh, uh, but it is certainly there. The exports that used to go from Saudi Arabia to Qatar, uh, industrial sector, certainly agricultural goods as well, that has gone down. But given the size of the Saudi economy, the, it's, it's a very limited impact on Saudi Arabia. I think you will see that when it comes to the U UAE and perhaps Dubai in specific, some of the, the, the repercussions have been more serious or more tangible, be it financial transactions being shifted from Dubai to, New, to London or New York, where Qatar is involved, so loss of some business volumes there. 
And certainly when it comes to Jabal Ali and the exports through Jabal Ali, which have now been rerouted to Oman and uh, uh, through that to, to Qatar. So we, we've seen a bit of a, more of an impact there. I think for the GCC countries at large, this is not a, an ideal situation econo economically. Certainly in terms of pure economic cost, the impact on Qatar is heavier than anywhere else. Uh, but given the financial reserves, we haven't seen r really the Qatar economy crack. We haven't seen a, a crisis develop in a way that creates panic in Doha or that forces the government to spend much more significant amounts of foreign, or foreign reserves to prop up the economy. And what are the implications of all of this for Qatar's main uh, export, main source of income, which is, of course, LNG, liquefied natural gas? I think the liquid of uh, LNG exports have been stable. I think that uh, global uh, demand has been healthy. And Qatar's uh, uh, relationship with most of its energy partners has not been damaged as a result of the Gulf crisis. Uh, unless there is an actual disruption in the Persian Gulf, uh, which is unlikely, I think, unless we see confrontation with Iran or a military uh, effort against Iran, then that, uh, uh, that LNG export will continue. It will continue to provide Qatar with much needed revenues, unlikely to change any time in the future. Uh, the, the, the positive element is Qatar is also planning to develop or further expand production over the long term. So we will see additional reserves, not in the next few years, but perhaps over a much longer time horizon. Uh, certainly, given all of these dynamics, I think that, that, that the leadership in Qatar uh, has options at least to strengthen its position over the long term. Ahem Kamel, thanks very much for being with us. A pleasure. And don't forget to catch Al Jazeera's special coverage of the Qatar blockade. One year on, we'll bring you interviews and insights from around the globe. Find out how everyday life has changed in Qatar and where the political situation stands right now. That's at 1800 GMT, Tuesday the 5th of June on Al Jazeera. I'll still to come on counting the costs made in Rwanda versus America first. How relations are souring over secondhand clothes. But first, Turkey's currency, the lira, strengthened this week after a major sell-off, which saw it hit an all-time low versus the dollar. It's still down around 15% so far this year. And for ordinary Turks and President Recep Tayyip Erdogan, it's a big source of worry. He's been battling to stop the currency crisis ahead of elections next month. In the past week, there's been a steep interest rate hike. The central bank governor has also tried to reassure foreign investors that capital controls, which would block money leaving the country, won't be needed. Although in the short term, this strategy seems to have worked, challenges remain. On Wednesday, credit ratings agency Moody's cut Turkey's economic growth forecasts. Well, joining us now from London is Charles Robertson, global chief economist with Renaissance Capital. Thanks very much uh, for being with us. So what's going on with Turkey's economy, particularly these big swings in the currency? It's taken a while, but there's been a massive buildup of debt, private sector debt in Turkey over the last 10, 15 years. And we've been concerned for the last two to three years that at some point in the medium term, like now, you're going to see lending stop, growth stop, and then people flee Turkish assets. Uh, because people have been buying into Turkey on the assumption it would grow 5% forever. Um, and, and the risk is it's, it's going to slump into recession. And why is that? Because they've, they've, it's that borrowing of too much. It's not particularly the, the, the size of the borrowing now. Private sector debt's about 70% of GDP. Um, China's double that. It's the scale of the increase over 10 years usually coincides with excess borrowing, uh, bad borrowing decisions, perhaps into real estate or, or something similar. And, and that tips over. We saw it a lot in the global financial crisis. A lot of Eastern Europe had that problem. To some extent, the US had that problem with the global financial crisis. Questions being raised as well, though, about President Recep Tayyip Erdogan's uh, leadership here and his stewardship of the economy. There were the, the comments that he made uh, earlier describing high interest rates as the mother of all evil. Um, and that was that, that kind of took a few people uh, by surprise, didn't it? And it, it raised questions about how independent 
uh, the, the central bankers are in, in Turkey. The difficulty here is that Erdogan was the market's darling for a good decade or so. Um, and there was always local concern, particularly among the kind of middle class Istanbul electorate, that he was encroaching, his power was getting too great. Um, he's now been in power for so long that there is very little constraint upon him. Um, he's appointed numerous central bank governors now. Uh, he's in charge of the army. He's uh, in, done a lot of changes to the judiciary. But it's the central bank which I think has concerned people the most because Turkey relies on foreign capital to fund its current account deficit. It, it always runs a big trade deficit. So it needs foreign capital. So to say we don't want to pay the interest rates required to attract that capital has frightened the markets. Um, and one of our concerns over the last few weeks is if you go back to Malaysia in 1998 in the Asian crisis, Malaysia said, you know what, we're not going to take foreign capital. We're going to introduce capital controls. We're going to not allow foreign portfolio investors to leave. Um, and, and that did let them cut interest rates. And it did help Malaysia's economy recover perhaps quicker than other Asian countries that had gone to the IMF and done orthodox things like the interest rate hike which eventually Turkey did choose to do a few days ago. Uh, yeah, and staying on this, the, the issue of the interest rates, the, the, the lira did rally uh, further uh, this week after the central bank announced this uh, streamlining of interest rate tools to, to, to focus on having one, one single main rate. Has that done anything to reassure investors? It's done. It has helped. It has helped. So the 300 basis point rate hike has helped. Um, having interest rates up at around 16% has helped. But also, for a number of years now, the central bank has been trying to raise rates but not tell the electorate in Turkey that they're raising rates to try and keep the president happy. Um, and this repo rate, which was sitting at around 8% and has now been raised to 16.5% or so, that that's, is a sign that finally orthodoxy seems to have won. And in the longer run, that will work. It worked for Russia when they did similar things a few years ago. Um, Russian interest rates are much lower now than Turkey. Russian inflation, much lower now than Turkey. So orthodoxy does win in the end, and it looks like Erdogan has, has given up. He's backed away. The central bank's being allowed to do what orthodox people would suggest and what the market wanted to see. What does that mean for Turks, though, when they're, when they're getting paid, continue to get paid in, in, in lira and their, their currency is seemingly losing value? on the international markets? It's, I mean, it's tough. I mean, it's interesting that a couple of years ago, Erdogan suggested that Turks sh should save in, in lira or gold. And gold has actually been a relatively good store of value uh, for Turkish people. Real estate, quite a good way to try and protect your savings. Um, but, but the lira itself hasn't been great. Um, so you're going to see inflation rise. Uh, that's going to hurt people. Uh, usually hurts the poorest. Um, we think we're going to see growth slow to, at best, 2 to 3% this year. Um, and the population is growing 1 to 2. So per capita, that's really not much of a gain. Uh, these, are, these are tough times for Turks now. Good to speak with you. Charles Robertson joining us there in London. Thanks very much. Nice to talk to you. Our trade relations between the US and key allies have taken a giant step backwards. The Trump administration is putting tariffs on steel and aluminium imports from the European Union, Canada and Mexico. They're threatening to retaliate with tariffs of their own as fears grow of a global trade war. Kimberly Halkett reports from Washington. U.S. Commerce Secretary Wilbur Ross made the announcement from Paris, where he was attending an annual trade forum. Tariffs of 25% on steel and 10% on aluminum imports into the United States from Canada, Mexico and the European Union all go into effect Friday. The move potentially sets in motion a trade war with some of the United States' most important allies, a claim the U.S. Commerce Secretary brushed off. Everybody has spats every now and again. Every family does, every country does with others. There's nothing weird about that. I think everybody will get over this in due course. In Brussels, the head of the European Commission called it a bad day for world trade, promising countermeasures that could include retaliatory tariffs on U.S. goods into the EU, on everything from blue jeans to motorcycles. What they can do, we are able to do exactly uh, 
the same. It's totally unacceptable that a country is imposing unilateral measures when it comes to world uh, trade. France's junior trade minister promised a similar response, suggesting the U.S. president may be misinformed. There comes a point when one needs to look at the figures, and I'm surprised that maybe President Trump's staff haven't shown him how much those European companies had invested in the United States, had created jobs there to assemble and produce there. Now, those U.S. jobs could be at risk. Just as President Donald Trump seeks to fulfill one of his top campaign promises to protect the jobs of his supporters in America's steel and aluminum manufacturing sectors. It's not just international partners criticizing Donald Trump's decision to impose steel and aluminum tariffs on top U.S. allies. Domestically, members of President Trump's own Republican Party are also criticizing him and fear the effects of a global trade war despite White House efforts to downplay those concerns. A trade spat has also broken out between the world's biggest economy and a landlocked East African country over hand-me-downs. A multi-million dollar business has grown up around selling clothes donated in charity shops in the U.S. thousands of miles to Africa. Critics say Africa cannot hope to develop a domestic textile industry when it's flooded with cheap imports. So Rwanda has imposed tariffs and wants to phase out imports of these second-hand clothes. The U.S. is responding with a threat to pull Rwanda's duty-free access to some of its products. Rwanda's president, Paul Kagame, is not backing down. Ali Khan Sachu is a Nairobi-based investment advisor and chief executive at Rich Management. He says Africa has become a dumping ground for cheap goods from other countries. This is an attempt by Africa to get leverage on the value chain. It's an attempt to develop industry. It's an attempt to industrialize. And essentially, you know, we've seen all our industries hollowed out. One of the classic examples is actually textile manufacturing, which is now being addressed in East Africa. And I think it's important that we look at things holistically. And if we're going to look at it holistically, we can't talk about the industrialization of Africa on one hand, and then be dumping Africa with all kinds of, uh, of goods, and in, in this case, in, in the case of used clothes. Our oil prices have been falling this week, with the world's biggest producers looking at a change in strategy. Reports say Saudi Arabia and Russia may increase oil production. Last year, it was about reducing the amount of oil in the world's energy markets. So now any proposal to boost output would mean a major reset. That's going to affect crude prices, and investors will be waiting until June 22nd when OPEC members meet in Vienna to see what happens. Well, joining us now from Zurich is Cornelia Meyer, economist and independent energy analyst. Good to speak with you again, Cornelia. So are we looking at a major rethink then in, in the, the strategy of oil producers? Well, I don't think we're looking at a major rethink, but we are looking at them addressing the issue that we have over the last year lost about a million barrels out of Venezuela, and we're going to lose a, a few hundred thousand out of Iran, thanks to the sanctions. So I think they're looking at it, they say compliance of the OPEC, non-OPEC agreement is at 183%, which Russian energy minister Alexander Novak um, sort of equated with being at about um, one million barrels. So they're going to say, OK, there is some headroom and they're going to put some in. But it's not going to be that easy because within OPEC, you know, when one country ups production, um, others might feel slighted because, you know, you have a very delicate balance of, um, of production quotas. So what's behind all of this then, do you think? I mean, is it, is it part, of the, part of it just that, uh, that they were too good at uh, uh, wanting to raise prices? Uh, before and now we're seeing the effects of that. No, I think what they've done is they've taken... It was not a price thing. It was getting rid of that overhang. There was there was just a glut of oil in the market. There was an, uh, an overhang um, of, um, of of inventories. And the, the agreement of cooperation was designed to take out that um, overhang and put it back to the five-year average for OECD countries. 
They have achieved this. Mission accomplished. Now, what's happened in the meantime is the 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 um, the, uh, the uh, obviously the the sanctions against Iran. It's Venezuela falling off a cliff. It's also N N Nigeria and Libya having their own internal problems. So a lot of countries actually are producing less than they were expected to produce, or exporting less than we're expected to produce, and and are expected to um, produce even less. So um, so so now they've sort of overachieved and now they need to address the overachievement. And how does the United States uh, figure into all of this, and particularly the, the shale oil producers there? Well, actually, it figures in quite a lot because um, the U.S. is set to overtake or is scheduled to overtake Russia as the world's largest producer this uh, this year. Um, uh, Russia is is currently the largest producer. So on one hand, we will see more exports of um, of um, the, the the oil from of the oil from the U.S., especially shale oil. We had um, uh, China, for instance, has never imported more than they're slated to import this month from the U.S., but um, uh, mind you, there's another thing also. If you're Russia and if you're Saudi Arabia, you know, the two really big producers in Saudi Arabia, the real, only real swing producer, um, then obviously you want that agreement of cooperation because you need to give a counterbalance to this new um, emerging um, American um, uh, powerhouse of, 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 of exporting crude. Good to speak with you. Cornelia Meyer joining us there from Zurich. Thank you, Hassan. And finally, Greece is preparing to exit its third international bailout this summer. The country signed up for the largest sovereign loan in history to prevent bankruptcy. Greece's latest bailout ends in August, but the austerity measures will continue for at least two more years. And workers in Greece are unhappy. They've seen their incomes fall by 15% during this eight-year economic crisis. As John Serapolis reports now from Athens. Several times a week, Alexandros Minimatidis sings for his supper. He earns about $20 an hour, four times as much as in his regular part-time job as a shoe salesman. With two sources of income, he helps support the household he grew up in, but he cannot invest in his own future. Five years ago, he enrolled in a robotics degree course at Kalkida Polytechnic, two hours' drive from Athens. But he can't afford to rent an apartment there, so his studies are progressing slowly. At the present rate, it'll take me another 10 years to graduate. I'll be 35, and at that age, it'll be really difficult to find a job in my area of expertise. He's one of the many victims of salary cuts averaging 15% during the economic crisis. Creditors demanded cuts to make the economy more competitive. The official minimum wage is now $690 a month before tax. But experts say the salary cuts weren't effective in the absence of other reforms. While salary cuts should have led to a cut in the prices of products and services, they didn't, because product markets are to a great extent monopolies or oligopolies. We have a large number of multinationals operating in this country which didn't lower the cost of their products. They benefited from the salary cuts, but they didn't become more competitive. Half of all new jobs are part-time or seasonal, and that still leaves 20% of workers unemployed, around a million Greeks. And there is so much underemployment, the Labour Institute, Greece's leading employment think tank, says the real jobless total is closer to 27%. But the worst effect of the crisis is loss of income. The dramatic drop in incomes has created a class of working poor. The risk of poverty has doubled during the crisis to 35% of the population. That's a rate unmatched anywhere in Western Europe. And it is twice as high among working age adults and the children who depend on them as it is among pensioners. Many Greeks, such as Mnimatidis, no longer see the point in learning skills or higher education. Greeks are forced to accept jobs they're overqualified for, which leads many to go abroad. The Labour Institute says government leaders need new policies to encourage entrepreneurship and employment, entice companies to lower their prices, and for the cost of labour to fall. Without serious reforms like these, many Greeks fear, for all their education, they'll likely remain the buskers of Europe. And that's our show for this week. Remember, get in touch with us by tweeting me at Tazim Seeker and use the hashtag AJCTC when you do, or drop us an email. Counting the cost at aljazeera.net is our address. There's more for you online as well at aljazeera.com CTC. That'll take you straight to our page, which has individual reports, links, 
and entire episodes for you to catch up on. That's it for this edition of Counting the Cost. I'm Hazem Seeker from the whole team here. Thanks for joining us. The news on Al Jazeera is next.